It is Thursday, April 24th, 2014. I'm Marie Denoya Aronson here for the Center on the American Governor with Michael Torpy, who played several significant roles in the administration of former New Jersey Governor Christy Todd Whitman. So, Michael, counsel, chief counsel, and chief of staff, you were very busy during the Whitman administration. It was. Was. Did you have a favorite role that you played? I think I enjoyed the chief of staff position uh, probably more uh, than the others I held, but uh, um, I, I enjoyed every moment of the administration. It was exciting from day one, and I was there from the very first day, and I left on the very last. So backing up a little about you, mm -hmm. where did you grow up and go to college and law school? I grew up in Somerville. Uh, and uh, in Somerset County, and uh, went to uh, local parochial schools there, Immaculata High School, and ultimately graduated from uh, St. Michael's College in Vermont, and and went to law school at Seton Hall. Graduated from uh, Seton Hall Law in '89, and was admitted to the bar the same year. Tell us a little bit about your family. Well, my, my family was very active in uh, civic and political affairs in Somerset County. My father was very well known uh, in Somerset. And uh, was, I knew uh, Christy Whitman's parents and then Christy uh, herself. And so I was introduced to politics and government through uh, my, my father's association and his activities. And as a kid, I was, uh, I, did those things that kids do on campaigns, banging lawn signs together and what have you. Uh, one of my father's best friends uh, was Ray Bateman, who uh, ran for governor on the Republican ticket in uh, 1977. And uh, his parents lived down the street from me, about four houses down. And uh, so we had a, I had a very active political life as a kid, tagged along with my dad to a lot of events and what have you, and uh, kind of got uh, kind of caught the bug, I guess, when I was a, was a kid, ta you know, tagging along with my father. What were your earliest impressions of what politics is? Well, I, I, one of my earlier uh, memories uh, of, a, of meeting a, a, a politician who had an impact on me uh, was Millicent Fenwick, who was a local congresswoman at the time and, and uh, quite a personality and was... Uh, and I remember meeting her at a, at a luncheon when I was, I don't recall exactly my age, probably 12 years old or so. And, um, and I just remember uh, just her, her views of government and her views of, uh, of um, uh, public policy really had an impact on me. And I, the, the issue, and what, what came through very clearly from people like Mills and Fenwick was the notion of public service and that this wasn't about you know, acquisition of power. This was about being involved in government. Was was a public service. Is that when you thought this is for me? I I don't know that I thought about it uh, quite like that. But I I was involved. Uh, I was involved in student government when I was in high school. I went to college. I ended up uh, running a campaign for one of my professors as a sideline, just as something fun to do. Got some of my friends involved uh, in that. Uh, ultimately, he was the first Republican elected from a very Democratic district in, in Vermont. This is right in Burlington, Vermont, which is anchored by a socialist uh, <laughs> mayor. Was uh, Current U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders was the mayor at, of Burlington at the time in that district where I, uh, where I ran this uh, campaign. And so it was, that was interesting, a lot of interesting uh, uh, political dynamics in play there and, and just kind of got, uh, kind of kept up with it. What was your first position in politics, other than this campaign that you just mentioned, your first paid position? Yeah, well, I, I first uh, went to the State House as an intern in 1985 and right out of college. Uh, my intention was to stay there just for a few months, and then I was planning to go to law school down in Washington at American University. And uh, I enjoyed the internship so much, I asked my boss at the time, uh, Brad Brewster, I said if I, and this was in the midst of, this 1985, there was an election going on, um, and I said, hey, if we win the uh, control of the assembly and you have the opportunity to add more staff, would you hire me? And he said, yes, I'll, I'll, you're on. So I decided to go to night school at uh, Seton Hall 
And then um, we ended up, the Republicans took control of the assembly in the 85 elections and the Kane landslide, and I've been there ever since. What was it about working there, even as an intern, that you found so compelling? Well, there's, there's definitely an energy uh, in politics that's undeniable, I think. And I, th I think if you talk to anyone, regardless of their political persuasion, uh, that's, that there's something about the energy that, that really grabs people. Uh, certainly, I had an interest, though, in public policy. There's no, I, I, I had that interest uh, throughout my life and through college. And so, I, it, obviously, the opportunity to, to have an influence on the public affairs of, of, the, of, in this case, the state, was of interest to me. So when you looked at the assembly people and the state senators, you had a lot of respect. What, what was your impression of them? Well, I, I, I did have a lot of respect for them, and at the same time as I got to work more closely, I got to see some of the more interesting aspects of their personalities. And uh, I, I, I have to say, I, I mostly I enjoyed that. I mostly uh, came to respect people even more, and that was not always the case, uh, but, but I, uh, I, I found it, it just an interesting and, um, and kind of a fulfilling place to work. When did you first, I know you mentioned that you knew Christy Whitman's mm -hmm. parents at a very young age. When did you first meet her? Well, I, I really didn't know Christy myself. Uh, we were not, uh, she's just a few years older than I am. And uh, so uh, when she was um, in getting involved in, in uh, politics, I really wasn't uh, around uh, at the time, in Somerset County at that time when she was a freeholder and then into the Kane administration as a BPU president. Uh, but I, 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 I think that the first time I met her was when I started, you know, or prior to start working for her in the transition after the 93 election. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so not part of the, what did you think during the, uh, her campaign against U.S. Senator Bill Bradley? Well, I, I, I met many of us uh, who were in the assembly, I was on the assembly staff at the time, Republican staff, were uh, thrilled at what she was able to do in that race. And that was the, um, that was the first indication uh, that there was something happening out there that would ultimately lead to the 91 races, uh, legislative races, where Republicans took uh, major majorities uh, back after being out of control. And so uh, Christie's Senate race was the first indication that, that, that there was a big wave that was forming out there that was going to ultimately sweep Republicans into uh, power. Did you have a sense watching, I guess, from the sidelines of that campaign that you wanted to be involved with this person and wanted to support her going forward? I, I have to say, at that time, I was very focused on the assembly. Um, I, uh, after the 89 election, uh, the, the, uh, we, the Republicans lost control of the assembly. There was a major staff reduction. And I was a mid-level staffer and uh, thankfully made the cut after we went from about 50 down to about 17 staff and I was able to survive that cut and so I thought well this might be my place to to uh, do my work and uh, after the 91 races where we uh, went uh, back into control I was um, I was promoted and um, I was made one of the deputy directors so I was one of the two deputy directors of the staff and so I, I was really, I was really focused on on doing the the legislative work at the time. I hadn't really thought about uh, moving to the executive branch. That uh, that opportunity was still a couple of years away as, anyway. How did you come to be involved with her? And I said you said your first experience was on her transition. How did right. that happen? Yeah, prior to, uh, exactly. Uh, what what happened was that a after she won, um, <laughs> I did. I did have an interest in in, uh, in moving to the executive branch. I, I made that uh, I made that interest known uh, to Hazel Gluck and, and uh, John Sheridan, who were the co-chairs of the transition team. And I, I then got a call from Peter Venero, uh, who was the governor had already indicated was going to name as the chief counsel to the governor. And um, Peter called me. Uh, we, there was actually a, a matter that, uh, of interest to uh, the governor in transition that I was also handling uh, on the legislative staff. And so I worked uh, 
on that matter with Peter. And then thereafter, Peter called me and asked whether I would join him on, on his staff as deputy chief counsel. Um, did you have a role in the Ed Rollins situation? Is that the matter you're no, talking about? No, oh, no, okay. no. The matter had to do with uh, there was some um, discussion at the time of building a, an arena in Camden. And uh, Governor Florio, on his way out, was looking to accomplish that. And he needed the support of the Republican legislature to do that. And there was a lot of skepticism. Uh, and the governor uh, and Governor Whitman. Uh, Governor-elect Whitman at the time right. was not supportive of that. And I was part of a staff group that analyzed that project. And frankly, we did not think it, it made sense. And so we ultimately opposed it. Uh, in, and it obviously never occurred. Right. What about the Ed Rollins controversy? What were your, what's your recollection of, of that situation? Well, I, I really was not, at that uh, point, was not part of the, formerly part of the, uh, the team. So I really did, had no inside uh, knowledge or I wasn't working on the matter. From the outside, um, it, it was obviously disconcerting. Um, but, and I didn't, I didn't know this. I, 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 I felt this about Christy Whitman, but I, having not worked with her yet, I didn't know for a fact. But I could not have believed that she or anyone close to her would have uh, actually have done anything that was, had been alleged despite the fact that Mr. That's Rollins right. made the, that, that allusion to uh, paying off, paying uh, off yeah, the ministers. To keep, to keep the minority uh, vote down. So right. I think that from my point of view, it was, yeah, it was a little disconcerting, obviously, but I didn't believe it. And, uh, and ultimately, it proved not to be true. So a big part of uh, Governor Whitman's administration was her tax cut policies. What was your role in, in that? part of things. <laughs> right. Well, as my, uh, my primary job as the deputy counsel to the governor was as uh, I was often the point person for the governor in the legislature. Now, I should say that it's very much a team approach, uh, so I wasn't by any means the only one. But I, I was hired uh, because of my, uh, my experience in the legislature. And uh, we, there was very little experience on the staff. Uh, with the legislature. Uh, and Peter Venero uh, himself recognizing that, um, he, he hired me for that purpose. And so I, I was, um, my, my role was not just on the tax cut, cuts, but on any significant uh, piece of legislation was to figure out a way to get it through. Uh, now we, we of course had Republican majorities in both houses, so that's, that was helpful. That's often a double-edged sword though. Yes. And uh, in this particular case, these policies, I think, were popular. The governor ran on them. She made it clear that this is what she wanted to do. And, um, and, and I think the little bit of the surprise that happened yes. was that the governor announced at, at the, uh, in her inaugural that she was going to accelerate the, um, uh, the tax cuts. Make them retroactive. Yes, right? and make, sure yes. That, make them retroactive. And so that was a... Um, that, that was a bit of a surprise. And I do know that the legislative leaders were not informed of that until just before the speech. And um, I can't say that I was involved in that decision, but, uh, <laughs> but I thought it was, uh, it was an interesting little twist right at the beginning of the administration. Did it make your work on the legislative side a little bit more difficult? Well, the, the legislature likes to have their they're very focused on process, and so sometimes when things uh, surprise them, there's a tendency to, you know, pull back a little bit. Um, but we we did have a very um, there, there was a lot of support for these tax cuts. The governor ran on those tax cuts. Many of the legislators who had just been elected um, had endorsed those tax cuts. Not all of them by any means, but but many of them had. And so the tax cuts. Uh, in and of themselves, I don't think were particularly difficult, but, but they were part of an, an overall budget uh, strategy that had as part of that a number of different pieces of legislation that were not as easy to get done. And uh, so we had, a, we, we, we had a very difficult, uh, I, I shouldn't say difficult, a very intense first six months. And the difficulty is that you come into the, you all start in this administration, the staff comes on board, no one, many people don't really know each other. 
Uh, you all come into these new jobs. They're brand new. None of us ever held the positions that we were actually hired to do. And you immediately begin governing. The first day when the governor is, is inaugurated and you're on staff, you are now empowered to do your job and whether you know how to do it or not. And this is very much akin to trying to build a car as you drive it down the road. And it's, a, it's, it's fascinating, uh, but it's incredibly challenging. Wow. So apparently you were part of meetings that involved Steve Forbes and Larry Kudlow. Tell us about that. Yeah, th this goes back actually in, during the campaign time when, when I was uh, on the legislative staff. Um, the very long story short is that through a contact, I was uh, asked to meet with Larry Kudlow who was advising the governor on her tax cut policies. And I, a couple of my uh, junior staff had been, with my approval, had been working with him to provide him data so that he could do a proper analysis. I ultimately uh, met with Larry, and then it, the speaker at the time, Speaker Hytian, did not really know that this was going on. And, and, uh, but I do know that he was very supportive of the governor. And I did know that he was supportive of tax cuts, and so we, uh, there was a meeting that was scheduled to occur at, uh, at, at, Pontefr at Pontefract, the governor's home in Oldwick. And uh, at that meeting would be Larry and Steve Forbes and, and, the, and Chuck Hytian and, and Donnie DeFrancesco, the Senate president, where she was going to seek their support for these tax cuts. Pri just prior to that meeting, I met with uh, uh, Larry and Speaker Hytian uh, at, um, at a little uh, restaurant in Oldwick and kind of we kind of got our act together. So Speaker Hytian was very supportive of the tax cuts and um, we went to the meeting. Uh, the meeting was uh, not, didn't go quite as well as maybe the governor would have hoped, or at this, in this case, the candidate would have hoped. Uh, there was a little bit of pushback. Uh, I know that uh, Senator DeFrancesco uh, was a little uh, concerned about this and thought that this would be a uh, difficult uh, political position to take. Um, I, I should just flash forward and say uh, Senator DeFrancesco was extremely helpful in getting this done ultimately, but at the time was a little skeptical. And uh, Ultimately, uh, I, again, my, my recollection is the meeting didn't go so well. Actually, I think that you asked me before whether what the first time was I met the governor. It was, it was at her house at that meeting. And, uh, and um, that uh, it was a little uncomfortable. <laughs> the, yeah. Did not stop the governor. It's pretty high stakes. As I, right? as I came to understand, <laughs> that's just the way she is. Wow. And, you know, she had done her homework. She had made her decision. She was being... Um, she was looking to gain the support of the two key legislative leaders, um, and she was going to do it. She was, she was not asking for permission to do this. She was informing them and, and telling them also that she had good reasons to do it, and that's Larry Kudlow and Steve Forbes had done an analysis and were there to provide that. Uh, but it, it, ultimately, she, she went out and announced it, and um, I know Speaker Italian was very supportive, as were many of the Assembly candidates. There was a little bit of a, I was part of the, the uh, campaign team in the assembly at the time, and there was a significant, um, uh, there was a, a bit of a rift that happened in se several of the campaigns where the assembly candidates who generally supported the tax cuts separated from the Senate candidates, who some of whom did not. And that proved to be a little bit difficult because many of these campaigns were run jointly, jointly financed, uh, jointly managed. And so it was, uh, it was a different, it, it, that was difficult. But by the time we got to governing and got to the point of the governor being inaugurated, um, I, most, most of that had started to fall in line. Just what were some of the, I mean, politically, it seems as if this would be a, a big win. I mean, tax cut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what were the, were the concerns that it would just not be doable? Is that what? I think the biggest concern r really was the one that, formed the basis of the, of the greatest criticism coming from Governor Florio and, and some others, and that is that once you remove these revenues, uh, that then you don't have 
you, then what are you going to cut? So that was always the that was always the political debate. Well, if you want to cut taxes, then what are you going to cut programmatically? And since since most of the uh, Governor Florio's tax increases were uh, were were passed in order to generate new what in effect were state aid programs, uh, the new uh, state school funding program, the QEA, and also to fund a homestead rebate program, um, that if you're going to cut the tax revenues that, that supported those, then okay, does that mean you're going to then cut the state aid? And, um, and Governor Whitman's view was that, uh, that tax cuts done properly uh, would stimulate economic growth and that it was not a question of, of simply uh, subtracting um, from the from the state aid programs in order to support tax cuts, but that they they would in fact enhance economic activity, and um, and I think there's and I think she was proven correct. Now whether the tax cuts were the primary reason for that or whether there were other things going on in the economy, but the point is is that ultimately the uh, economic activity of the state uh, grew fairly dramatically during her time in office, and we were able to uh, support the tax cuts by. Uh, growing out of our problem. Your first role was deputy counsel? Yes. Uh, when were you promoted to chief counsel? I, I was uh, promoted chief counsel uh, during a series, I was kind of the tail end of a, um, uh, of a series of moves that occurred following the death of uh, Chief Justice Wilentz. Uh, Debbie Ports was the attorney general at the time. She became the chief justice. Uh, Peter Venero went from chief of staff over to uh, the attorney general's office. And Harriet Derman, who at the time was chief counsel, became chief of staff, and I became chief counsel. What were your responsibilities at that time? Well, the, the responsibilities of the uh, chief counsel were fairly well defined. They're defined in statute, uh, for one thing. And in effect, you are, in fact, the, the, uh, the governor's lawyer and all the people on the on the council staff are, in fact, governor, the governor's lawyers. They work for the governor uh, in her capacity as governor, but they work for the governor. We don't work for anyone else. We don't represent anyone else in the state, unlike the attorney general represents all departments of the state. Um, primary role, though, that was defined at the beginning of the administration and really never changed was obviously the review of all legal matters, including legislation, uh, oversaw nominations of prosecutors and judges. And, and op, in, inside the State House, our, our primary operational role was to be the chief liaison unit to the legislature. Um, what what did, did you find it challenging? Were there some challenges that you were up against in that role? Well, it, I, I would say that the, uh, the, the legislative uh, liaison um, role is clearly the most challenging, at least to my uh, to my mind, the um, we we had a, uh, I should say I had a staff of uh, many of whom I inherited uh, from my prior chief counsels, including Peter Venera from the very beginning. He hired a very extremely competent staff of lawyers, and uh, I, truthfully, I did not have to do much in the way of legal work. The people, um, the the subordinate staff, was were outstanding lawyers, and by the time that things came to me for my review, it was often a rather cursory review. It didn't require a lot more input it because it was so well done. I had some absolutely brilliant people working underneath me at the time, and including my deputy was John Farmer, uh, who became uh, attorney general, and among other things. And, and uh, John is a brilliant person. And he's, he's a brilliant writer as well, and so he, so it, I had to, in terms of legal work, I, I was basically reviewing, ensuring that it met with the governor's policy goals, and um, but uh, the, it was the liaison role with the legislature, the kind of the hands-on working to uh, gain support for what we want to do, or for that matter, stop things that we did not want to have happen down there. It's also the most. You know, it's also the most fun part of the job as well, and yeah. uh, it's but definitely a double-edged sword. So then, 1997 comes around, and you're appointed chief of staff. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. When did that happen? How, I mean, I know when that happened. Right. Why did that happen? What were the circumstances surrounding that promotion? Right. Well, the uh, 
the governor, of course, had just been reelected. It was very close, uh, closer than I think anyone had uh, thought it would be. That was a little disconcerting. Um, it was it was frustrating because I, I and I think I I don't want to speak for the governor, but uh, I can say that for me and for many of us who worked uh, closely with her, um, I, I think we we were disappointed because we in terms of the elect uh, the fact that the governor wasn't uh, elected on, on more strong more strongly. Um, because we really thought, and I think I still look back, and historically I believe this is also the case, I, I think she had an extremely uh, strong uh, first term and had accomplished a great deal. Had she, had, she had said she would do certain things, and she did them. We, we kept a, a scorecard that, was, that, was, uh, that we, we reviewed every other week and to make sure that we were... Uh, you know, reaching the goals that she had established, both as campaign promises and then after coming in and establishing more uh, uh, goals, we, we went through constantly uh, looking to make sure that we, uh, that we did the things that we said we were going to do. And, and we are incredibly, the governor was incredibly successful in that respect. Um, you know, politics being what they are, some things um, kind of, I think, took us a little bit by surprise. and. Um, I have to say that um, uh, Jim McGreevy, uh, soon, soon thereafter be Governor McGreevy, ran an extremely good campaign, very extremely well disciplined. And, um, and so he, he made the race very, very close. So I think we were frustrated at that, frankly. And what happened then was that um, Harriet Derman was chief of staff at the time, and Harriet had always indicated her desire to be a judge. Uh, this goes back to her, uh, I think even, I, th I believe that she um, had first indicated her desire to be a judge and then was ultimately recruited to be a, an assembly candidate and then became an assembly member of the assembly. So, and, and I don't think that was really what she had intended to do, although she was a very good legislator. And I, I, met, I met Harriet in her capacity as a, as a legislator when I was working on that, the staff that supported the Republicans. And uh, got to, and I knew Harriet very well, and she uh, I think made it, she made it clear that she would like to um, time to for her to actually do what she initially set out to do I think several years before which is to become a judge, and so uh, the governor asked me to be chief of staff. I have to say honestly I hesitated um, because I was very I. I while I was not very old, I felt that I might have been a little burnt out uh, from those four years. Um, people don't survive in those jobs very long, typically. And uh, I thought about it, and I thought, well, that's kind of crazy. This is a unique opportunity, and I had obviously had enormous respect for the governor. And I think also some of my competitive instincts uh, kicked into um, going back to what I was saying about being frustrated by what happened. Uh, and that this was not the time for me to leave, but it was the time for me to step up. And, and if the governor wanted me to do it, had that confidence in me, then, then I should absolutely say yes. And it ended up being your favorite. You said it did. The three roles it did. that you played. Yeah. Yeah. I, I ended up with a tremendous group of people around me um, that I think uh, I mean, made it very fulfilling. Uh, but made us very successful, I think. I think the governor had an extremely successful second term, um, which is not always easy. Going back to the, um, the re-election campaign, you mentioned that uh, candidate McGreevy ran a really good campaign, mm -hmm. and that's why it diminished the, the margin of victory for Governor Whitman. Where did he, in your, in your opinion, gain a foothold there? Well, the, the issue that he, yeah, that he seized upon was auto insurance. Uh, that, right. was, that was the one where we really, um, we, we really did not get, uh, get, get it together uh, as well as we could have. Now, I should say that interestingly, uh, Governor Whitman identified auto insurance as an emerging issue that needed to be addressed. Her, she herself did that the year uh, prior to, so in 96. And, and I, I have, my recollection is that when we were uh, considering, I think it must have been the 97 state of the state, and uh, that's usually a, a process where several weeks before that we, we talk about what we wanted to, what the governor wanted to talk about. 
and we started, we would t toss around the issues that needed to be addressed. And I remember her saying, you know, I've been out there and I'm hearing a lot about auto insurance. Now, auto insurance, as you know, in New Jersey has been a hot topic, but it ebbs and flows. Especially then. And especially right. then. And, yeah. it, and, it, and she had clearly detected an uptick in, in uh, public concern over auto insurance. And so we set out to try to address that. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that we addressed it effectively uh, in the beginning half of 97, and that permitted uh, uh, candidate McGreevy to seize upon it. Uh, I, I will say, and, and I should say, I, I've, got, I've gotten to know Jim McGreevy, and we, I, 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 I respect him. But I, I'll say this, that I, I think at the time we felt and that he basically demagogued the issue, where he he put out prescriptions for uh, that that really could not be accomplished, uh, and, and and that were not were legally impossible uh, to accomplish. But they sounded good, and interestingly enough, I flash forward to when he was governor, and he, he ended up uh, he ended up passing a series of auto insurance reforms that have have been have worked about as well as anything has. They reflect. They they were a lot closer to what Christy Whitman actually proposed than than what he was proposing at the time in '97. Uh, so I give him credit for that. That's really interesting. Yeah. But it, his message resonated so much because it, sure it was did. a pocketbook issue for so many people in New Jersey, right? Yes. So, so he had a lot of emotional uh, energy. <laughs> he kind did. of the wind at his back for and, that. And as right? a candidate, he was extraordinarily disciplined with his message. Uh, and he was uh, able to, he just stayed on this and just beat it and to death. And, um, and we were, and, and, and the thing about Christy Whitman is Christy Whitman never says anything that she doesn't believe. And so the, it would have been nice for her to maybe have, you know, uh, made some more politically acceptable, attractive uh, statement. Uh, on the issue that would have maybe satisfied the public, but if she didn't think it was something she could actually accomplish, or she, or it was something she didn't actually believe in, she wasn't going to say it. And we were, and so uh, we were a little bit stuck on that issue, um, and and you know, almost paid for it with the with the loss. Wow, yeah. um, I I love that message discipline term. Um, because it cuts both ways. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a great campaign device, but um, I, and then this isn't to put any <laughs> anybody who runs for office down. But but does it get to the truth for, for voters listening? <laughs> you know, that's that's a question. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true. And uh, but you know, I we do see you you can't you can't uh, you don't get a chance to govern unless you win an election. And you have to win an election. You have to you have to, I'm not, you need to say things, and you need to say them in ways that, that resonate with people. Yes. And I think that, and, and by and large, I, you know, Christy Whitman it, was a, extraordinarily successful in doing exactly that. And, um, but in, in the 97 race, it just, you know, the dynamics I just described were such that it did not, it, you know, work so well in our favor. Right, right. Yeah. So going into the second term, as you said, you had that competitive feeling. What were some of the things that you, the major issues that uh, the governor wanted to accomplish that you were involved in? Well, in the second term, uh, she certainly laid out her desire to um, increase the state's um, land preservation goals. And that was, uh, that was uh, certainly one of the hallmarks of the second term. And uh, very aggressive about that. I would say that politically, uh, that our, her team who oversaw her political well-being, mm -hmm. um, we, we were focused on improving her, um, her you know, popularity as well. Um, and again, you can't divorce popularity from effectiveness as a leader. And so, those, and so we felt that in order to accomplish some of these things that, that she said she wanted to get done, that we needed to it, it, we needed to improve her uh, public image, given the, the really uh, the little bit of a beating that it took during the, the prior uh, campaign. And so we did a we did a number of things uh, structurally uh, inside that I think uh, were very effective. And uh, we we made some we, there were some personnel changes that occurred. Um, uh, Pete McDonough uh, was 
moved from, he had been on the campaign as press secretary, he moved over and became director of communications in the governor's office. New, new press uh, secretary, Jane O'Connor, very, very effective. Um, we, I, I established for the first time an Office of Intergovernmental Affairs in, in, in the governor's office. Now, the, 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 this office did exist in prior administrations, but it had not existed in the Whitman administration. And th that group uh, was a group of campaign operatives primarily who I had brought inside with their goal of being the primary liaisons to local government officials. And so that we had a, a way of doing kind of the caring feeding that was necessary politically to, uh, to local officials, local political leaders. By the way, of both parties. Uh, we, this was not something, we, we, we were obviously conscious of, our, uh, of, of the fact that we were Republicans and we had a, uh, and there, sure there was a Republican bias, you might say, but it, this group was, was a group of government um, employees who did focus on ensuring that uh, all the local officials of the state had a, had a, a way to communicate with the governor. Um, I should say that just recently, I, just a few days ago, I, I ran into a, um, a significant Democratic mayor still in office who, who did say to me, and it just uh, I hadn't seen him in a while, and he said, you know, I, I go around and I tell everyone that the Whitman administration was the best administration to deal with. And I said, well, why is that? I said, that's, that's funny. It's the first time yeah. I've heard that from you. And he said, yeah. he goes, no, you know, it's, it's absolutely true because when I always could get an answer out of the Whitman administration. When I, when I needed something, I, could, I knew I could call, I knew I could get an answer. It wasn't always the answer I wanted, but I knew I could always get an answer. And I think, um, so I, I, that, was, that was nice to hear, uh, you know, 14 years later, uh, 15 years later, but it was uh, nice to hear. Yeah, by design, you by, run it to be that. Well, I think there, uh, yeah, and, and you know, that, I think that was also true of um, our cabinet. Our cabinet was very outward um, focused. These are some of the things that we we really insisted upon. We insisted that the that the cabinet actually identify the ways in which they were going to be more active and and increase their outreach, and and we did coordinate. I think more effectively internally than we had previously, uh, and and a lot of that was due to the fact that uh, the governor had promoted many of us from within. So we so we were not. We were really, we might have been new to these specific positions, but we had already been inside. Her, her, uh, her core, you know, four people in the, in the beginning of the second term had all been with her throughout the first term. And so, um, so we, we, all knew, we, we all knew her, she knew us, we all knew each other, and we worked extremely well together. It was a very, it was a very tight operation, I think, at, at that point. Now, in 1999, when Governor Whitman appointed Peter Venero to the Supreme Court, there was a lot of controversy mm -hmm. around the, um, the approval of that appointment, the confirmation hearings, mm -hmm. having to do with uh, racial profiling and Peter Venero's connection. What was your role during all of that? Well, uh, my role was to ensure that Peter was appointed to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, that's what the governor wanted. Um, uh, frankly, I thought Peter, and still think, he, he was an outstanding candidate. I think he proved that as, uh, in his time on the bench. Um, and so that was my, my goal was to get that done. Now, I will say that in those types of situations, um, it's not just about wanting to get it done because that's what is the right thing to do or what the governor wants done. Those things are important, but there is an issue that, that comes up sometimes where you have to win these types of uh, things because if you don't, your credibility is undermined and your ability to lead is undermined. And the governor staked a great deal on, on Peter's nomination. And, and, and I knew that, even though I personally was I'm friends with Peter and wanted to see that happen for him. And of course, the gov I, I, I saw this as one of those moments where we absolutely had to win uh, or else the governor would be undermined. And so we went about it accordingly. Can you discuss it at all about that process? I well, you know, the process, um, I, you know, sometimes um, I think there's an assumption that there's a lot of... Um, uh, things that are happening that are in some 
way nefarious or what have you. Uh, in a situation like this, this is a lot of this was about you know just good hard work, presenting the facts, making sure Peter uh, Peter had some he had some explaining to do. He did it. He explained it well. I think we, we had to recognize that there were some people who were not going to be with us strictly for political reasons. It would not matter what we said to them. And so you have to identify that. Sometimes it's important, just as important to know who's not with you and know that they're never going to be there and not waste any time trying to, uh, trying to deal with them, yeah, but identify the 21 votes that you need in the Senate in order to get the nomination done. And you know we, we have a you know there's a saying in the state house about it's uh, 41 21 and one wins 41 votes in the assembly 21 votes in the senate and the governor's signature that's a, that passes a law in the case of a nomination it's 21 votes in this in the senate I don't need 22 I need 21 and that's what you and that's the way we went at at this now it's always nice to build larger numbers but 21 is what we needed. Um, I don't remember the like, vote, but it was close. <laughs> I don't remember the vote, but it sounds like one. Would, would you say this was one of the the tougher ones, one of your tougher challenges uh, in your service? To I think it was. It, it was a. It was a tough one. Um, I, I frankly never doubted that we were going to get it done, and maybe that's part of what you have to, the way, the way you have to think when you're in these positions. Uh, I, I never thought we would ever lose anything any time we went to try to get it done. Uh, and, that, and that was the way that um, I went about it. I have to say, I wasn't uh, certainly not the only one. I, when I worked with Peter, that's the way Peter looked at it. Harry, it's the same, same way. Uh, Judy Shaw, it didn't, you know, we were, all of us, uh, Pete McDonough, I mean, <laughs> that we're all, you know, focused on, it, w once we make a decision, and I say we, meaning, you know, the governor's decision, but one that, one that we then have to support, that we have to get it, we have to accomplish that. And, and I'll note that with respect to the governor uh, and her decision making, she, she uh, was very deliberate in her decisions. And so we were never surprised by anything as a staff. We were never, uh, we never had to go back and say, Governor, I can't believe you said that. You made a commitment. How could you have made that commitment? It, it never did anything like that ever happen. And so by the time that she made a decision, we, we all understood what she was thinking, why she was thinking it. We had usually, on the big decisions, we had already worked through uh, what we anticipated to be the problems in, in getting it done. And so we were all ready to go. And so I, that's why I think a lot of us had a, always had that confidence that once we set out to, you know, once something was, was activated, that we were going to, that we would be successful. So were you surprised when Governor Whitman decided to resign before the end of her second term and, and join the Bush administration? Well, well I, I wasn't surprised. Um, and I can, I, can tell you, um, I can tell you that um, she, wouldn't, she wasn't necessarily looking for anything. But it didn't surprise me that she got asked. Um, she was a, obviously a national figure in her own right. She is obviously a, a Republican woman. Um, and she was also someone who had the ability to reach beyond the kind of the party and, and, and speak to moderates and, and, and to Democrats as well. So she, she has a set of political skills that, that are really uh, just, you know, major league political skills, and it doesn't, did not surprise me. And, and I'll, I'll flash forward to, I, I had in the very kind of interesting experience of um, after the discussions occurred privately about whether or not uh, she would join the administration, uh, the, the Bush administration, uh, she and I uh, flew down to D.C. Um, somewhat surreptitiously to go meet with uh, President-elect uh, Bush, President-elect Vice, uh, uh, Vice uh, President Cheney, um, and uh, Andy Card, the incoming chief of staff uh, to the White House. And um, I, I, she and I went up to the, there was a transition office set up in a hotel, and we went up to the floor where, the, where they were all meeting, and the governor 
uh, you know, the governor goes into that meeting. I waited in the hallway. And she came out, and I said, so what was it? <laughs> and I, I knew, kind of, we knew what it was going to be asked. And, I, and uh, she said, EPA. And I even said to her then, I said, so, what'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> and it was thinking, of course, she had said yes. But she said, well, I said yes. And her next comment was, when the President of the United States asks you to do something, you do it. And that was that. All right. Um, <laughs> That's an interesting story, yeah. though. I can I, picture I, it. <laughs> I should also tell you that at that time, um, just as a kind of an aside as well, I think that people may know that uh, President and Mrs. Bush's dog, Barney, <laughs> what came yeah. from the litter yes. um, of, uh, from uh, Governor Whitman's uh, dogs. And um, so Barney was delivered at that very moment. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of our staff members, our director of our, our Washington office, had taken, uh, walk, gotten Barney, brought Barney, uh, Barney upstairs to the same place. Uh, Mrs. Bush uh, arrived, and she um, and and we're showing Barney to Mrs. Bush, and she says, "Oh, I have to show the dog to to the president." And so she walked into the the room with Barney. And the next, the next thing you can hear from the outside is, I, oh my gosh, I can't believe he did that. And the dog peed on the carpet in the, in the <laughs> room. And, uh, but that was, yeah, Barney was delivered to the president that day as well. That's a great. Yeah. That's really great. Um, so in the overview, what, what would you say were the Whitman administration's greatest accomplishments? Well, you know, there are obviously policy accomplishments but, um, that I'll speak to, but uh, I, I really think that the governor, um, I, I think her integrity and the, her strength of leadership were, are the things that were the real hallmarks of her administration. I, I think that, um, and I'd like to think that even in retrospect, I think given the longer you know, arc of history, I think that, that will be, um, I think that's already being seen, and I think that um, it will continue to be viewed favorably. Uh, she had a very, very um, uh, strong leadership style. She, when she made decisions, she, she stuck to them. She never, she, she made them deliberately, but when she made them, she stuck to them. And I think there was a, you know, there's a certainty about the way that she led that I think is, 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 uh, uh, keeps people very. Um, I, I think. I think people. It resonates with people. So, from a policy standpoint, clearly I, the tax. There, there was an economic policy that was established that I think was uh, th that really led a national wave of, of uh, Republican tax cutters, and I think that that was extraordinarily important. Um, and, and one of the things that I think is need, people need to be reminded of, particularly given some of the things that have happened since she left office and some of the, the budget issues that have arisen, is that, is that we balance the budget. Uh, and of course, the budget needs to be balanced by uh, the Constitution requires it. So that in and of itself is not, a, is not the great accomplishment. But how you do it matters. And, by, and when the governor came into office, 15% uh, of the state budget was, was supported by one-shot revenues, and meaning that they were non-recurring revenues. Okay. And so um, we, we, are, we set out a goal at the very beginning of the administration uh, to, to minimize that and, po and, if possible, eliminate them. We actually did accomplish that in one year where, we, where there was a, a de minimis number of, of one-shots, and so it was practically down to zero. Um, we, we, and but we did reduce it dramatically from about 15% down to just a couple single-digit percentage points. Um, we, we contained the, the growth of state government. Uh, the, uh, the growth of state government was, uh, was uh, by, in historical perspective, over the four or five prior governors, and then in comparison to those since, it, it is one of the lowest growth uh, periods in, in, uh, in the state's history is despite the fact that we had some significant economic uh, growth. And that sometimes is difficult to accomplish uh, where there's a lot of revenues coming in. And so there is a tendency, particularly from the legislative uh, side of things, to spend some of that money. And so it's not that we didn't do it 
uh, it's not that we didn't take some of that um, economic activity or the revenue generated from that economic activity and dedicated to expanding certain um, programs. We did, but we did it carefully, and we did it in a way that 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 we believed would be sustainable in the future. And I think if you look at some of the big uh, budget metrics from our time in comparison to the prior uh, several governors and the, the, those since, uh, uh, Christy Whitman matches up extremely well. What would you say were some of her weaknesses or the weaknesses of the administration? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a tough thing because I, um, um, I, I think, see, there, with every strength there's some, there's some weakness and, and uh, uh, I would say that one of her weaknesses is that she was not always willing to do the politically expedient thing. Uh, I know that might sound a little, uh, a little self-serving, but but that's that was that was the truth. And, and I sometimes I, I tell people this that I one of uh, you know the great honors for me was to work with her in that capacity in several of those capacities, but mostly as the chief of staff, where. I had the unique opportunity to sit with the governor one on one with no one else in the office and we were and and um, so I got to there was nothing no no one no one th reporting on what we were saying no one and we had a chance to just speak uh, directly about things and um, I I remember on more than one occasion I would sit in there and, and I might outline something that's happening and you know here's some of the options and on, and believe she she would say things like well what's the right thing to do you know and you know I'd say well I think this is the right thing to do and she says I think that's the right thing to do too just do that and, and that's the way and, and that's the way she made decisions now some things were you know required some more political deafness and she was she was very um, astute obviously is very astute politically as well. Uh, but she was able to balance those, uh, she, she was able to do the right thing and at the same time she had a very uh, good sense of, okay, how, do we, how are we actually gonna get it done? To say you wanna do the right thing and actually get it done are two different things and that's where I think her political skills uh, came in. Wow. So you've continued to have a an interesting career since the administration. What um, tell us about that a little bit? Well, I, right now I'm I I have a lobbying firm. It's uh, and I have a couple of partners, and I kind of view it as a more of a boutique kind of operation. I don't have a large client list. I'm not seeking to have that. I like to do the work myself. Um, I have to say that um, one of the big changes for me was leaving the governor's office, where I had an extraordinary amount of support, um, and to going out and you know really doing most of my work on my own I, but I have to say over time I've really come to enjoy that part of it I, I, I because I ultimately I, I really think I enjoy you know public policy and development of solutions to problems and that's how that's kind of how I approach my my lobbying practice um, I've never had to do or say anything as a lobbyist that I was uncomfortable with, and um, I never had to do that when I was uh, working for the governor. So I'm happy that that that's uh, you know I can still say that today. It's a good career. Is there anything else that you want to tell us about the Whitman administration that I haven't asked you today? Uh, I think that the only thing I would I would say, and maybe it's just going back to what I was just reflecting on uh, before, is that I think that uh, Christy Whitman and her um, her and who she was as is as a person um, was is something that uh, I, I hope is I hope comes through in, in these interviews that you're doing is for those of us who talk about her um, I, I don't think that it's oh, that it, it can really be fully appreciated by the people of the state I think she did have the the, the, the citizens of the state uh, were uh, obviously did a did elect her twice, and that in of itself is a is an honor, I think, for her, for sure. Um, but I don't think they know how lucky they were 